I've noticed that I have some very unimaginative titles. Self-observation one. <laughs> Self-observation two, three, four, five, six. Work aim one. Work aim two. And so today I have a new title, When Worlds Collide. For those of you who are sci-fi buffs, you may remember the 1951 film based on the 1932 novel, a science fiction novel, that first appeared in Blue Book magazine in six installments from September 1932 to February 1933. The story basically is there's an approaching planet that threatens the Earth. It's going to go so close to the Earth or hit the Earth that it's going to wreak havoc and destroy it. The hero and his girlfriend then travel by rocket to a new planet, settle it, and save the future of all mankind by populating this new planet. When our worlds collide, it's not usually a big catastrophic event. For us, it's more due to our sleep. It's more like the invasion of the body snatchers, which was a 1956 sci-fi film based on a novel that was serialized in Collier magazine. Back in the 90s, I think there was another movie made of The Body Snatchers. The Body Snatchers was the novel. Invasion of the Body Snatchers was the film, the 54 film, or the 56 film. They're also coming out in 2007 or 2008 with a new When Worlds Collide film. I grew up with all that stuff. For me, it all makes sense. And it's easy to think in those terms. But in the invasion of the body snatchers, people are replaced by simulations grown from plant-like pods that are perfect physical duplications of their victims who they then kill and dispose of. Who we are is slowly replaced by this acquired personality that grows around us almost like a pod and encases us. And eventually, if it's allowed to, it will kill us. we will kill the essential you and there will be this duplicate there, not really, it may look like you, but it won't be you at all. It'll be this acquired thing, this machine. Either way, our possibility of transformation is destroyed. Man as he could be is never realized, while well, man as he is, slowly or not so slowly, depending on how we do it, destroys himself. So the question is, what worlds collide with us? So let's talk about our worlds. Let's talk about our physical world. The physical world is the world that is rendered to us via the five senses. We feel it, we hear it, we smell it, we taste it, we see it. Did I get them all? Just wanted to make sure you're paying attention and you're not. So I did get them all. I got all five? Okay. Without the five senses, the physical world vanishes. Think for a moment about Helen Keller. She could not speak, she could not see, she could not hear. She could taste, she could smell, she could touch. And because of the sense of smell, because of the sense of taste because the sense of touch, she was able to learn about the physical world and she was able to learn how to communicate with other people. Incredible story, but with just three of the five senses, she was able to render a physical world and live in it and communicate with other people in it. Two of the five senses, hearing and sight, are the two that we depend on the most. Even if the machine is imbalanced, without the two that we depend on the most, the others then can still render for us a physical world. Let's say you're eating something with great pleasure. In Steve's case, let's say it's a Zaydare hot dog with relish. He's eating it with relish and he's eating it with relish. In everybody else's case, it's something else. And so you're eating this and, and it's just delicious. It's wonderful. It's the best whatever you've ever had. And then somebody tells you that it's really spider stew and that those capers in there really eyes of newts and little snakes and lizards and things. And all of a sudden, you start to feel sick, really physically ill. So you can see that there are two different worlds here. There's one, the world of sense, when you are enjoying what you're eating. But then someone comes and tells you what it is, and this other world then makes you physically sick. So that's a good example of when worlds collide. Now, it may be an extreme example, and of course I have to use extreme examples to make a big contrast so that we can see these things because actually they're much more subtle with us. And it helps to see a stark contrast until we can get used to the subtle differences between these worlds. So what we see from this is that thinking is different from the senses. Thinking is really on another plane. It's on another level. But it affects 
the physical world, and the physical world can also affect that other world, the world of thought, even though it's on another plane. And so when worlds collide and this planet comes so close to the Earth that it destroys it, in the novel there are two planets. One doesn't come as close, and the other one comes so close that it destroys it, but the one that doesn't come as close is the one that they go to, the one that they send a rocket ship to and get people evacuated to it and settle it. And then the other one comes and destroys the Earth. Let's take a more subtle look at this then. You can see a person, you can touch a person, you can hear a person, or you can think about a person. Diana yesterday saw her mother, probably touched her mother, and heard her mother. Now she can think about her mother, but she can't touch her or hear her or see her. So we have the physical world and we have the psychological world. For Diana right now, her mother exists in her psychological world, not in her physical world. We imagine that we don't take pleasure in disliking people because it fits our pictures. Mm -hmm. It fits these lovely pictures that we have of ourselves, of what wonderful people we are, how loving we are, how generous we are, how kind we are, how easy we are to get along with. It's other people who are difficult to get along with. It's other people who are aggravating. It's other people who are annoying. It's other people who are tedious. But we're not. We're pleasant, reasonable people, not like other people. The funny thing is about disliking people and taking pleasure in disliking people. I'm not talking about just disliking people. Everybody dislikes people. Everybody probably takes pleasure in disliking people as well, but we'll talk about the other people for now because we know that you don't take pleasure in disliking people. Yet everyone always dislikes people and takes pleasure in it. I don't see that, really. I don't understand. How do you mean I don't take pleasure in disliking people? I don't, I don't want to dislike people. It's their fault I dislike them. It's not my fault. If they weren't so obnoxious, I wouldn't dislike them. I don't really want to dislike people. I really want to love everybody. So I don't take pleasure in disliking people. Yet, when someone else dislikes the same person that we dislike, we always take pleasure in the agreement that we get from that. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? It just kind of brings a smile to your face to hear someone else talk bad about somebody you don't like. Why is that if we're not taking pleasure in disliking other people? Pleasure we take in disliking someone or something, it doesn't really matter. It's an object. You can see that the person is an object. You can see them. You can hear them. You can touch them. It is a physical object. We take pleasure in disliking physical objects. You see a rat and you take pleasure in disliking the physical object, the rat. You're not seeing a rat right now. You're taking pleasure in disliking the psychological rat or spider or snake or whatever it is that does it for you. Pleasure we take in disliking a person as an object that we see and hear, can touch, is different than the pleasure that we take in disliking the person psychologically. It's not the same as when we're thinking about it. When we see an object, we take pleasure in disliking it. When we don't, we take pleasure in thinking about disliking it. There's a big difference. One is a lot more enjoyable. Which one? Psychological. Why is that? Because if you can, it's, a, it's limited. Yeah, you can make up yeah. all kinds of stuff to support you. Yeah. Good. You know that through self-observation. We're taking in impressions from the physical object, or we're taking in impressions from the thought of it. Either way, we're taking in impressions. So if the person is here in front of me, I can dislike him. You know, I can't stand people like that. I can't stand people who do that. I hate people who do that. It's so aggravating people who do that. Doesn't that just bug you that people do that? Don't you hate people who do that? Well, yeah, I hate people who do that too. Yeah, I know what you mean. I hate them too. God, they're so aggravating. Why do they do that? I don't know. They're just idiots. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. A day in the life. A day in anybody's life, really. It's not a day in the life of someone who's asleep. A day in the life of someone who's asleep is exactly the same, except they're asleep. They haven't a clue that their day is like that. They haven't a clue that they just said that, that, they, that their relationships are all based on who we dislike. They're all little cliques of who we don't like and who we do like. Well, you're in the clique, we all like you. Well, you're not in the clique, we all don't like you. And they take great pleasure in that, but they don't know it because they've never taken the time to observe themselves. They've always observed their gallery of pictures, their internal gallery of pictures of themselves and how wonderful they are instead. So there are two worlds that both have the same negative psychological effect on us. The world of the senses, we just like an object there. We take in impressions from that, negative impressions from that, and it has a psychological effect on us. 
Yet, if the person's not in our presence and we're thinking about disliking them, we're still taking in impressions mm. and they're still having a negative effect on us. So the effect is the same no matter where the impressions are coming from, whether they're actually coming from the physical through the five senses or whether they're coming through our thoughts and feelings. If we wish to overcome the pleasure of disliking a person, it's got to be in both worlds. You can't just work on one world. But you see, that's what, exactly what we do, isn't it? We get that person and people like them out of our world. We don't get around people like that. As much as possible, we control our environment. That's our first step, isn't it? But then we're on the freeway going to a friend's house, and one of those people is in a car next to us or in front of us or behind us. I don't know, it's a tailgater, or it's somebody who's driving too slowly, or it's somebody who doesn't use his indicators when he turns. Whatever. One of those people invades our world, and we get to see them and dislike them while they're there. And then they turn off the road. But when we get to our friend's house, we're still relishing the pleasure of disliking that person in our thoughts. And we can't wait to get to our friend's house to tell our friend just what that person was like and what that person did. And then they enjoy disliking that person. They relish and take great pleasure in disliking that person with us. And that's what makes us friends. And we call these friendships relationships when in truth they're really nothing more than negative entanglements. The work teaches that we must learn to handle one another rightly within, in our inner psychological world, not just out here. The world teaches us we need to learn to handle one another rightly out here. Uh, I don't like you, so I smack you. But you weigh 100 pounds more than me and you club me to death. <laughs> it's like, well, the world taught me not to smack people that are bigger than me that I don't like. So now I can only smack people that are smaller than me and I don't like. So I smack this little Oriental guy. But he knows Kung Fu, and he weighs 100 pounds less than me, and he kicks my butt so bad that I wish I'd never smacked him. And the world has taught me not to smack people now, whether they're big or little, because I could get my butt kicked, and I don't like that. But psychologically, an ordinary man can do whatever he likes. Outside, he can be the most pleasant, polite, seemingly genuine person, your friend. But inside can be a serial killer, a Hitler, a Stalin, a Joseph Mengele. We'll leave out the current heroes of our world. Saddam Hussein, and Idi Amin, Pol Pot. We'll leave those guys out. Those wounds are too recent. Recent history is too much for us. So we'll just look at the old bad guys, the people we love to we take great pleasure in hating and disliking and blaming. The people we always fail to locate within ourselves. We've got to become more responsible. How we think about others is important in this work. As a matter of fact, it's the most important thing in this work. How you treat others is not so important in this work. But how you think about others is very important. But for us, how we treat others is more important than how we think about others. Yeah. It's exactly backwards. And so this work challenges us. It challenges us to have our worlds kind of collide. When worlds collide, there's mass hysteria. <laughs> it's insane. They're evacuating the planet. They're evacuating. First, they evacuate all the coastal towns because there's going to be a tidal wave and it's going to destroy to miles inward. So they're, so they're evacuating the coast and all the coastal cities and they're moving people inland. That's the first thing. So there's got to be some order to all of this. You've got to know what is going to happen. You've got to know where to evacuate to. You've got to know where to evacuate from. Then you've got to have an orderly evacuation as much as possible. And so here we are with our worlds colliding and the work telling us, no, don't worry about how you handle people outside. That's not so important. What's really important is what you're doing inside where no one else can see. Now you know that this is true. You can feel it in the place where you don't want to feel it. It pricks you in the place where you don't want to be pricked. It touches you where you don't want to be touched, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Of course, if it doesn't, you don't belong here. If it doesn't touch you where you don't want to be touched, you don't belong here. You belong in a morgue because you're dead. Well, it's the truth. And I don't mean dead physically. I mean dead psychologically. I mean dead in the work sense. If you take pleasure in thinking evil of others and thinking negatively, and you take a sense of satisfaction from it. In a work sense, your inner world is a mess. If you haven't noticed that your inner world is a mess, you haven't been observing yourself. You need to begin to observe yourself. As if you were observing an interesting stranger. 
You've got to remain conscious of what it is you're doing, conscious of what self-observation means, that you're remembering yourself. I'm remembering who I am, what I'm here for, what my aim is, what my goal is, in a work sense. As I am observing this interesting stranger who's enjoying hating all these people, who's enjoying getting agreement about these people he doesn't like. If that's the case, you're in danger of destroying the potential you. The potential you is the you that could grow up to be somebody. And I don't mean in an outer way, I mean in an inner way. The you that is touched by this work and that is wounded by this work. The you that is wounded by the truth about this false you, who you believe is you. In order to continue to develop, in order to develop at all, we cannot take pleasure in unpleasant thoughts about others. Ooh, now you've gone from preaching to meddling. Now you can just stop right there. What do you mean I'm, I can't take pleasure in unpleasant thoughts about others? Well, that's what I mean. But I'm not just going to leave you there because that's too vague. It doesn't help. Uh, great. So I'm not supposed to take pleasure in having unpleasant thoughts about other people. And that's the only kind of thought I have about other people. I mean, think about it. As a rule, that's the only kind of thought we have about other people. We don't think pleasant thoughts about other people unless they're agreeing with us. But mostly, we're thinking unpleasant thoughts about other people. People listening to this must be thinking, what kind of a world does he live in? A world where the lights are on, not a world of soft candlelight, elevator music, not a romantic bar, but more like an operating room where the light is bright, where things are clearly defined, where you can see something and where you can do something. Cease taking pleasure in hatred, negative criticism, and external relationships would alter completely. Stop taking pleasure in hating other people. Stop taking pleasure in negatively criticizing other people. And right away, you must be able to see that all external relationships would be drastically different. All these people who want to legislate nice, but it never happens. Excuse me. When I was growing up, only the schools in the big cities had to worry about people bringing guns to school. Now, I don't care where you go to school. Shootings were rare. They weren't non-existent. They were rare, very rare. You can't say that about your world today. Not in this country. We are not able to legislate kindness. There are external and more internal reactions. We may react externally, mechanically, for a long time and be unable to change anything about it. How can you meditate two hours a day and still be such a jerk? It's easy. Try it. Well, that's why I don't meditate. No, that's not why you don't meditate. You don't meditate because you're lazy and you don't value what it could give you. And the excuse you're using so that you don't have to look at how lazy you are and how you lack values, the excuse you're using is that other people who meditate aren't as good as you want them to be. Now, that's the truth, see, in the operating room. That's not the truth in the bar. In the bar, where there's soft lights, candle lights, nice music, you know, a little smoke, and some booze to go around to keep us anesthetized. And the booze is what? Imagination. Imagination, very good. What we use to anesthetize ourselves is imagination. We imagine all these things about ourselves and other people. I imagine that, oh, I just don't have time to meditate, I'm too busy. I imagine that, well, all these other, it doesn't work because all these other people are doing it. And look at them, they're a mess. But not like me. I keep busy. They sit around like potatoes for two hours a day. Pumpkins. They sit around in the pumpkin patch. So, here we are, unable to stop our mechanical external reactions that are negative. Yet inside, we really want to stop them. But they won't stop. We get in a situation, and inside we're like, oh, God, why, shut up. Can't you hold your tongue? No, if I could hold my tongue, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't say that. It's a tiny member that creates a world of woe, and it's almost impossible to control. If we've got insight, and insight only comes from one thing, and that's self-observation, then we don't have to let the internal agree with the external world. And that's it. That's what we got, people. The external world is out of control. Our external world is out of control. Mm -hmm. We do the very thing that we don't want to do. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to agree with it internally. And this is what the work gives us as a starting place. To separate, to learn to differentiate between the two worlds. Because we can't differentiate. We can't. I have a question right here that someone left for me. 
You talk about imagination. I find oftentimes I'm so used to imagining that I cannot tell the difference between what I am imagining and what is real. Can you give me a red flag to watch for that will indicate when I am in imagination? We don't know the difference. We have to learn to differentiate between the world of the senses and the world of our inner psychological thoughts and feelings. This inner world, this internal life of ours of thoughts and feelings, is the world that the work organizes, builds, and arranges in an orderly way. That's what has to happen first. There's not much we can do out here, but in here we can really work. I can work in here. I can't do much out here. But if I can let a little bit of light in inside, where that light touches, I can see. If I am sincere, if I'm genuine, if I really want this, I can see something. And if I will view what I see as if it is an interesting stranger, rather than identify with it, oh no, it's me, oh, I can't be like that, no, no. But oh, look at that. Isn't that interesting? It thinks that it doesn't have any of those negative qualities. It thinks that it doesn't do that. But look, it does that. I just saw it. That's letting a little bit of light in. The object of this work, the object of self-observation, is to let a ray of light in to the inner world of chaos. And what makes it chaos is it's in disorder. What puts it in disorder is the lack of light. There's no way to order it without some light. How can you see what to put where without light? You can live in a room. It's totally dark. And it's just fine. You turn the lights on and you look around and you go, oh my God, how could I live here? And that's what this work is about. It's about turning the lights on in our internal rooms, as it were. Once we can do that, we can then organize and order what goes on in that inner world. As I said, an ordinary man behaves as internally as he pleases. Externally, he's polite. Internally, he's a serial killer. He doesn't know that what he thinks and feels matters. But you've got to start to see that what you think and feel matters. It matters more than what you do. But you see, our world isn't like that, is it? You find yourself objecting to that. You find something in you says, no, that's not, that's not right. That's not the way it is. What we do is more important. If I kill somebody out there, if I take a gun and shoot somebody, that's more important. Really, why? Well, because then they're dead. But if I just think about killing them, they're not really dead. No, but you are. And this isn't about them. This is about you. We're talking about the possibility of your evolution, not the possibility of evolution of mankind, but your evolution. Mankind has no possibility of evolving, but an individual, a man, does have the possibility of evolving. Now, you can live in imagination and imagine that you're going to evolve for the whole world, but you're not. You can imagine that you're going to make things happen for the whole world and lift the level of race consciousness so that the whole planet comes along and is more peaceful and is happier, but you're not. But you can imagine that you are. And I don't want to argue about that. After a while in this work, you behave better inside than you do outside. That's because the internal must change before the external can change. How else could it happen? <laughs> there is no other way for it to happen. You don't just change externally without some interchange first. You had to do something to get that interchange. You can't change an external reaction without seeing what inside of you is lying. What thoughts and feelings are produced within you? You've got to see what is produced inside of you. But no, we see only what's produced inside of us connected to what happened out there. Well, that person did that. That made me feel this way. No, 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 no. Turn this all around. I am in a negative state. When I am in a negative state, it doesn't matter what people do out there. I am negative and I'm going to take it negatively. How do you know that? Well, you're in a negative state and somebody says, Hey, how you doing? What do you mean by that? You've been there, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Somebody says something nice, but you take it the wrong way. You take it the way they really meant it. Because you got the inflection. You got the secret meaning. You saw the secret eye signal or the secret hand signal. You really know the real truth. And I really know the real truth, too. You're negative. And when you're negative, everything turns negative. Through inner taste, in the light of this work, and with sincerity, we begin to dislike our internal life. This is our only hope, people. If you cannot dislike your internal life, you have no hope. You've got to be able to start to dislike what is going on inside of you. You've got to be able to see it for what it is. Chaotic, disorderly, hateful, not a pleasant place. Certainly not a place anyone in their right mind would want to live. 
But we keep it all hidden. We keep it all covered with lies. And this is why the work says everything for us is wrapped in lies. Because everything is wrapped in lies. Everyone we know is wrapped in a lie in personality. We're wrapped in a lie in personality. And then when we do begin to dislike our internal world, we begin to struggle with the thoughts and the feelings privately. Because that's the only way we can struggle with them. Because if we start to tell somebody else what we're doing, then pride and vanity take over. And the next thing you know, all the work is useless because we're doing it all and it's falling on the wrong part of us. In order to have it fall on the right part of us, we've got to keep it private, keep it internal. We may dislike a person when he's in front of us, but we don't have to enjoy thinking how we dislike him. Now, yes, it's a subtle difference. And I said it would be a subtle difference. It's a kind of a subtle difference you can't really see or hear. It's the kind of a subtle difference that the work says you have to taste. It's not as salty or it's more salty. It's not as spicy or it's more spicy. It's not as bitter. It's not as sweet. It's a taste thing. And you have to learn to taste your internal world. You have to learn to distinguish between the external and the internal. It seems so obvious, but it's not obvious because imagination has blurred the lines and we can't tell where we are. We begin to separate our worlds. Or in the science fiction sense, we leave the doomed physical planet for a brave new world with a sun light. And we build, order, and populate it with a new race of supermen. Incidentally, you may be interested to know, or you may not, one way or another, I'm going to tell you, Superman also came out of that whole thing about the world when worlds collide, that whole thing. Came out of the same thing. Here is this guy that was sent from another planet. His planet was being destroyed, and he, the child was sent in a rocket ship to this planet. And he ended up on this planet because the gravity of this planet was so different from the gravity of that planet, he ended up a superman. So the story repeats and repeats and repeats, and it's because it's an archetypal symbol of our struggle. And our struggle is between these two worlds. First thing you've got to do is you've got to begin to distinguish between sensation and thought. Well, that's not so easy. Okay, you've been doing Vipassana meditation for a year or over a year now. So you are beginning to distinguish the difference between sensation and thought. You can say, that's a sensation, that's a thought. But if you'll think back to the beginning, you didn't know the difference. You couldn't tell the difference. It's only when you began to really observe, genuinely observe, without identification, that you could start to discern the difference. And you still get lost. So first we clearly see the difference between sensation and thought. And after we can do that, we choose the world which has the power to alter the other. And then we get to work. And when you can distinguish the difference between sensation and thought, you then know that one world, the internal world, the psychological world, the world of thoughts and feelings, is the only one that can really influence the world's sensation. But we have it all backwards. We think, oh, but this hit me and that hurt and that's why I feel bad. No, that's not why you feel badly. The internal world doesn't have to be pushed around by the external world. Now, I can tell you this because you have some experience of this in sitting long hours in meditation and dealing with pain as a sensation that isn't pain. as a totally different sensation, just as a sensation and not saying it's painful. And you've had the experience of it not being pain, it just being a sensation. Oh, it's just a sensation, just like any other sensation. Now, some people who hear this won't have a clue what I'm talking about, but you know what I'm talking about. And that's because that's what this work is about, which is why I had you start Vipassana. And so, see you next week.